And we're back, and with me is Tom Doyle. Tom, welcome to Fast Forward. Thank you, Mike. I'm glad to be here. First off, congratulations for winning last year the Washington Science Fiction Association Small Press Award for Short Fiction. Well, well thanks. It was very exciting to be honored here locally. Yeah, and, and that was for your story, uh, The Wizard of Makatawa. Yes, right? in uh, Paradox issue number 11. Mm. And it's a uh, magazine of alternative history or history that has some speculative fiction element. And it's a fascinating story because it's all it's tied to Oz. It's tied to Frank Baum and and the Oz stories and the Oz stories show up in it. Uh, what what was kind of the driver to get this in there? It's not like some of your other stories, which tend to be more science fictiony. Well, I grew up on the uh, at the resort where Frank Baum used to spend his summers. And it was kind of part of the lore while I was growing up. People would point to this cottage or that cottage and say, oh, that's where he was when he told stories to a little girl named Dorothy or this and that. There's this whole local folklore, most of it not true. But um, having grown up with that, I thought I should really be able to do a story that I can bring that lore into it. And I happened, the summer I started to think about this, I was back in Michigan, I was at Clarion, and I had access to the Library of Michigan, which had some very obscure sorts of Frank Baum manuscripts on hand. And I took a look at those and put it together with my own experience and let it cook for a while. And that's and that's, How what the came, that's what came of it. it, it was a, it's a really neat story. Um, some of the things that the main character does in it, are these things that you did? Are there things that go on there, the bonfires and, and the, the plays? And the, uh, yes, yes, they, they were. Most of the kind of rated G things that were going on in the story are the things I was up to. But there were some kids who were up to things that were a little more dramatic. <laughs> And those experiences also went into the story. Um, one of the things you mentioned while you were talking there was that you started working on this in Clarion. And you are a graduate, I guess is the term, of the Clarion, uh, what's it called, the Clarion? The Clarion Writers Workshop. Some people refer to it as Clarion East to distinguish it from West, but they like to say, no, we're the first one, so we don't have to have the geography on our uh, name. Why don't you explain about Clarion for some of the viewers that may not be familiar with it? Okay. Well. Clarion is a workshop for about six weeks, and it's almost a science fiction and fantasy writing boot camp. And about 16 or so students would be there under various instructors who will take a one-week stint, so six different, at least six different instructors. And, but most of the instruction really comes from each other, that people are writing stories the whole time, they're giving them out to the other people in the group who write their own critiques. And in a circle, they'll tell you exactly what went wrong with your story. And something about the, that environment, that kind of boot camp, tends to push people from being people who are almost selling stories to people who, at the end of it, start selling. And I don't know what the, the magic is. There's nothing really rational that could be bottled or put in a book about the process. It's just going through the process that really seems to help people. And you're all living together, right? You're all living together on the dorms. That's insisted, or at least used to be. I don't know the, the current rules since they've moved to San Diego from East Lansing. But part of the rules where you are all living together in the dorm, you're socializing, you're learning some of the fanish games with each other. You're uh, it's an introduction to science fiction and fantasy culture in some ways. Yeah, and you had some amazing people working with you there. Um, was Howard Waldrop was there, Amelo Hopkinson, Kelly Link, um, James Patrick Kelly, Ed Scott Edelman. I mean, these are some prime writers, particularly working in the short fiction area, to really kind of beat it into you. Oh, they, they were marvelous. They were all very supportive even when they were tearing up the work, and they were people who, to me, demonstrated that you could do whatever you wanted within science fiction and fantasy. That's the, the wonder of that, those genres, that they are not limited, um, at least the way they write. They do not 
believe in the limitations of, oh no, you can't do that, or you can't break that formula. And, yeah, and, and they're also that, different. Yes. That's, that's one of the great things, is it exposed you to a lot of very different kinds of writers that come from a lot of different places, and uh, that's got to be just an incredible experience. It absolutely was. They're, I would say if anything they had in common was that they tended to the more literary side of things, that they tend to cross over as far as Maureen McHugh, for example, mm -hmm. her book gets featured on NPR or Nalo Hopkins and stuff now probably gets shelved off the science fiction and fantasy as much as it's on, even though they personally are committed to genre and being members of the, the speculative fiction community. And I found that's that also for me is a kind of inspirational of the possibilities within uh, writing speculative fiction. Yeah, it just, it just had to have been great. So which, do you have any of the stories that kind of came out of the Clarion experience uh, been published? Um, yes, uh, most of them actually, oh, which was uh, also heartening. This um, Wizard of Makatawa was researched during mm -hmm. that, but really didn't come out of that. My first professional sale to Strange Horizons was a story called Crossing Borders. That came out of the last weeks when everyone was very kind of tired yes. and on edge. <laughs> and I thought, okay, I got something for you. And uh, Jim Kelly was very funny during that. He, he had been uh, very supportive. He had been threatening, you know, I'm going to tear up everything and give you the blue line of death and all this because you guys, you know, you have to really go after each other and such. And when he saw that story, he goes, there's no blue line of death here. Wow. And he started quoting it to the circle. And I go, okay, I think, I think this story might happen. Might work, yeah. yeah so. <laughs> it's a, that's a trip of a story. I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm not sure. It, it's one of the things, because a number of your stories, you have female protagonists. And, and I believe this one does too, correct? It does. And it's, it's kind of far future. And it's, it's a very sexually charged story, shall we say. It is. I find, I was socialized, I would say, as a kid, mostly by girls and women in a lot of ways. And so when I look at a protagonist, I'm, as you point out, just as likely to go for a female protagonist as male. Because um, I find the character, and you know, I, I'm focused in my observation and my experience comes at least as much from the distaff side, if you would. Um, with that story, I have also have a pattern of, I like to find jobs in the near or far future for people who might not fit in, who might in fact be in institutions in our current environment. I think that we do not really understand the full spectrum of what it means to be human as we stand now. And a lot of our futures tend to pare it down to a very limited sort of humanity and not terribly interesting for a writer all the time either. So this is a way for me of kind of finding jobs for these people in the future and exploring the more extreme situations that arise when you have more extreme people yeah, in and this future. was an extreme person. I mean, this is somebody who, who you know, is a, is a killer and, and a bringer of chaos. Well, she eventually decides that her name, in fact, is Eris. She goes through the story with a denial of names. That's part mm -hmm. of her glitchiness, if you would. Um, but by the end of it, she's kind of denied her birth name and said, you know, this is my true name, Eris. And in fact, I found this particular character interesting enough where I've written a novel. Excellent. And uh, since then I've managed to interest an LA agent, or rather literary management um, company in the story. They're interested not only in taking it out to publishers, but uh, in the movie potential of it. This particular uh, company was, is now associated with the Ripley's Believe It or Not project with Chris Columbus mm -hmm. and Jim Carrey. And they also have connections with the producers of uh, the American Pie and Final Destination movies. So talks are going for it. It's very exciting. 
I don't know what's going to come of it, but in the meantime, you know, I just continue writing, and it's mm -hmm. fun to have someone out there working for you. I could see the, what, from what was in that story, you know, there's, there's some good visual aspects and stuff that I could see working in the movies. So what kind of stuff happens in the novel? Where do you go with the novel from that story? Well, at the end of the story, she has two agendas. One is that she wants vengeance against her employers who've manipulated her edgy psychology for their use. So she's decided she is going to go after them. And they turn out to be a dangerous crew populated with people <laughs> like herself and other sorts of uh, kind of extreme personalities. So that's part of the challenge. And part of the challenge is gaining control back of her own life and uh, emotions. And that she has to go back into her history in a way to track down what happened. How did these employers get hold of her. Um, you may have picked up in the story that she has family issues. She has to go and deal with those. Um, and she does this in the context of kind of a broad galactic picture. It's a, it's a, it turns out to be a society where the singularity went bad and that's why people like her um, still exist. That uh, the, the integrity of the personality has become a, a religious kind of first commandment in wow. the society because of the singularity going badly, that the re resistance, it's been decided that no longer will humanity go down the slippery slope of cybernetics and mind control and such. It's just completely excluded. So while they can repair the flesh at will, the mind is left pretty much as it is. As broken as it, it is. is. Yeah. As broken as it is. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Sounds good. Oh, it, Look forward it to reading it sometime. Um, one of the things I found fascinating when I was checking things on you on your website and things like that was um, you've had a pretty interesting life. For You lived in Japan. You were an expat for a while in Japan. For how long was it? I was there for a year and a half. Yeah, yeah. It was an interesting year and a half. The Kobe earthquake and the gas, the Aum Shinrikyu gas attack happened while I was oh, there wow. as well. And I used to stay out till 5 a.m. on a regular basis. I had a nice nine to five <laughs> job actually where I could do that. And I wrote down a lot of those experiences and sent them and email was a novel thing at the time. And so I was sending back uh, these Gaijin chronicles of my experiences. From those, I took a look at those um, after Clarion and I decided I could take those and kind of put those through the mythopoetic reiner and come up with a story called uh, The Floating Other World. Yeah, it was a fascinating story. And I was wondering how much of, because it is, it's about an American man in Japan working at a job and going out one night and kind of getting to like something very other. <laughs> yeah, um, he ends up basically in the Japanese other world, kind of yeah. the Japanese equivalent of fairy, if you will. And he, um, the story, yes, it's large parts of it are based on, I did one time party all night with a Yakuza, for example, and uh, ended Whoa. up, yeah, and <laughs> it's very fun uh, to be going along in an entourage with a gangster until it's time to go and he doesn't seem to want the party to end and it's very, mm. very tense, uh, you know, difficult, as the Japanese might say. And so, but yeah, aspects of all the experiences in there were at least close to my own, you know, that I saw or heard or actually did. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting story. And, and again, it moves away from the hard edge science fiction into the more fantastical element and it really works well because you really don't know, you know what's going on, where he's going, what's going to happen. And I love the fact of bringing in the other culture and the other mythos in it. And you've done that more than once because the Garuda bird, which I found fascinating, um, works off of the, the Indian mythos. That was my uh, specialty or uh, area of specialization in undergrad. I was studying about India, its history, and I, used, I took a course on Indian folklore and mythology, and there was an actual story. A lot of the folklore from the kind of 
India equivalent of the Middle Ages, has what we would think of in the West as this fairly blasphemous aspect of people imitating gods and not being punished, but rather rewarded for their craftiness at the end of the story. And so I thought, well, I should be able to retell this story somehow. And then I thought about, well, I can mix it with science fiction. I can have it be a story that is being retold in a near future India, where India, in the contest that's coming for whose century this is going to be, India's or China's, I take India's side. And so it's the age of India. And in this uh, exciting uh, future for India, uh, an adventure out of old folklore happens, and the people in the story are conscious of this folklore aspect in a way that people in India are, because the Prime Minister, for example, is an actor who has played the gods in the Indian godly roles films. Out yes, of I, love, I love the Bollywood references in it and the way you worked that in in songs. It, was, it just made the story, like it, it gave you both ends. It gave you the mythology and it gave you the science fiction. Okay. And it was just, it was a lot of fun. Well, thank you. That's another one I would think would make a good movie. Yeah, you know? I, I would think so. Yeah, I, we'll have to see about that one. <laughs> you know, it's um, with Slumdog Millionaire and such, yeah. people are becoming more interested in uh, India culture and aware that India is kind of the, a, a coming power and uh, wanting to understand more, get beyond like Gandhi and such into more of the details. Yeah, into, into the, you know, the everyday, the everyday life, which the culture is really part of the everyday life there. So what, what can we expect from you coming up? I, I imagine more stories. You've got your novel you're, you're hoping for? Actually, mostly on the novel side now. Um, having finished this Border Crosser, the, the novel of Crossing Borders, I'm at work on a urban contemporary fantasy that I hope to be finished with soon, get that off to the agent, and then, uh, the agent would like to see a novel based on The Wizard of Makatawa. Wow. He's been, you know, so I'm going to start that this summer, I think. That should be fun. And that should be fun. <laughs> I am not sure where she's going to go next, if it's further Oz or other folklore, but I will. I look forward it out. to it. Well, well, Tom, we're out of time. I want to thank you for being here. It was great talking to you. And um, I just hope everyone just looks for Tom's stories and look online. A lot of them are online and uh, keep it coming. Well, thank you very much for having me here. It's been a lot of fun. It has been. Well, that's it for this episode of Fast Forward. So from all of here, us here at the Fast Forward Studios, this is Mike Zipser saying take care.